Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Above the Haze. Eric Postow, Holon Law Partners. With me today, Rod Kite, cannabis attorney with Kite Law. Uh, he's based out of North Carolina, but also does a lot of international things, just supporting the cannabis industry and community globally. Rod, thank you so much for being with me today. Long time coming. Yeah, it's really good to be here with you, Eric. I'm, I'm excited about our conversation. Absolutely. So look, I think I'll just kind of jump in. Uh, we both have been in this industry space for a number of years, and you know, we, we're tackling very similar issues. We represent similar clients. Uh, I, I think that I can speak just from my observation that your care and concern for the people of the industry uh, uh, kind of shines through, and that's really important to me. I think a lot of folks get lost in the you know definitions and words and marijuana and right. federal illegality. On the other mm -hmm. end of these things are, are human beings and people, and most of them are just trying to make a living, take care of their families, and work with a plant and create products that consumers want. Uh, and, and just curious, you know, your journey to now, you know, how, how did you how did you get to where you're at, and 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 how did you kind of uh, uh, identify what was important to you uh, in working in this space? Yeah, sure. I, I think that's a great question. And I think you and I both um, see that in this industry. It's one of the things that I really love is, is you know, beyond all of the, the, the disputes and the, you know, every, everything else that happens, there, there are people and, and I really enjoy that. And I guess what sort of informs my passion for it is the, the actual passion for the plant. I got involved and I've told this story before, but I'll, I'll be brief. I um, have, have always enjoyed cannabis. But I had cancer and went through chemotherapy back in 2009, and I specifically did not use cannabis because I was trying to be, you know, do all the things the doctor said. Um, but I had an experience where one night I just felt so bad that I just I'd read that cannabis could be use, useful in chemotherapy. And so I just tried it with literally no expectations. And the, the difference that it made was so overwhelming and profound. It literally caused me to change my entire um, legal career and, and career path generally. And I, I thought, I've got to get involved in this industry and how. And, I, and so the journey began just by figuring out how to shift from just sort of a, a general law practice where I represented businesses in, in various capacities to the cannabis law path. And being in North Carolina, and this is in 2009, um, I, I, I didn't have a lot of uh, you know idea of how to do that. So I just sort of fumbled through. But it just so happened that it, it coincided with the um, shortly thereafter with the enactment of the 2014 Farm Bill, which legalized what they called industrial hemp for the first time in almost 100 years. And while a lot of my colleagues were on the West Coast focusing on, you know, California and Oregon and Colorado and getting licenses for very specific grows and, and, and dispensaries and so on and so forth, I couldn't do that. I certainly couldn't do it very well, you know, geographically. But at the same time, I started getting calls from people about this thing called CBD. And I thought, what? OK, well, I'll dive in and figure it out. You know, I'll read up on it and see if it's legal or not and, and realize there is not really much, if anything at all, about CBD, its legal status. And so that led me to spend a lot of time contemplating it, talking with people. And I came up with the source rule, which is very simple in retrospect. But it was I think it, it was it had a lot of meaning at the time. It still informs a lot of what happens in the industry. And that is just the source of a cannabinoid determines its legal status. And from there, it just started to go. And, and here we are today, almost 10 years later, you know, talking about the cannabis industry and, and where we are and where we're going. And, and that's sort of a really quick overview. I don't want to bore everyone, but that's, you know, I guess to kind of circle back around to the people. I've always dealt with real people who say, hey, Rod, I've, I've got a small business. I'm trying to make it. I really have a passion for the plant. I really want to do this. A lot of my own clients have switched their own careers to do this. And, and, and so it's, it's helped me feel like I was doing something that was real versus just pushing paper or trying to make a buck. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the personal uh, narrative there. I mean, a lot of folks you do meet, a lot of folks I've interviewed on, uh, on uh, Above the Haze uh, have that personal relationship with the plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they were informed from a personal relationship, they could see through the, the smoke screen that was federal yeah. illegality, um, a weird legislation, uh, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So let's talk about the weirdness. Yeah. Of <laughs> We've got a, a system right now that on the one hand, you could be a billion dollar multi-state operator operating in multiple different jurisdictions where the only thing that isn't in is interstate commerce potentially 
is the plant crossing a state line. But by and large, they are doing interstate commerce of uh, regulated marijuana. On the same time, we have people getting arrested for working with the plant, selling the plant, uh, trying to understand the plant, so on and so forth. We also have uh, a intentional effort in some ways to bifurcate the plant into two distinct categories, industrial hemp and schedule one marijuana, which has led to a division within the plant community uh, because the schedule one side is faced with 280E and tax uh, uh, nightmares. And on the hemp side, uh, largely the hemp products were facing a lot less scrutiny and regulation and were able to reproduce or produce uh, uh, identical uh, products by their um, uh, what they actually do, or ratcheted up milligrams of Delta 9 or Delta 10 or Delta 8 or whatever it was to give the intoxicating effects, and yet they weren't subject to the same rules and regs. So we see some conflict uh, there that's emerged from 2014, 2018 farm bills. We've got an, uh, an extension for one year on the, uh, on the farm bill. I think 2024 is going to be a wild ride to figure out what is this going to look like. Uh, I wonder, you know, what's your observation of, of the, the micro ecosystem that we're, we're all working in and the division amongst the plant community and what solutions that you'd like to see uh, come out of uh, legislative activity in 2024? Yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, you sort of hit the nail on the head as to where we are and, and what we're likely to see. So I'll start by saying I'm an advocate and an attorney for cannabis. It's one plant, right? It's it's not like it's it, people say, oh, it's two different species. It's not. It's one plant. And we have an arbitrary line distinguishing between what's what's a controlled substance and what's and what's not controlled at all. And, and it's absolutely arbitrary. And so I think it's it's no um, it's no big secret that I, I represent primarily hemp companies and that I really am sort of an advocate for the hemp side. But I want to be clear, that's not because I'm anti-marijuana or anti-the plant or anti-business and everything else. It's because I'm a cannabis advocate. And, and to get to your question, the way that I see legalization, broad scale legalization happening is through sort of the hemp path, through the farm bill. And, you know, I, I think, frankly, the, the regulated system um, of marijuana is broken. And it's understandable how it arose historically. You know, it's, it came, had, to, had to come through states to begin with, I think, because of the acceptance at the federal level. We still have trouble passing, you know, basic bills like the Safe Banking Act and things like that. You know, and so it really had to come up through the state system. And I think it was, it was sort of an unknown quantity. And I think people were willing to concede a lot in order to, to get this ball rolling. And so it's understandable how it came through, but it's absolutely broken. I mean, there's no need for something like metric. There's no need for um, onerous taxes. There's no need for onerous regulations. There's a need for some, some systematic regularity and some regulations that make sense that we could talk about you know, later on if you want to. Um, and there's a need for businesses to be able to to operate interstate and, in fact, even internationally as the, as the globe begins to, um, you know, to turn on to cannabis legalization. And, and there's a need for broad access, both for the consumer um, and also for business folks. You know, we don't want to create an industry where a small handful of, of you know, you know, super capitalized uh, multinational corporations control an entire market and where consumers don't have much of a choice and a lot of consumers are left out. So all that is to say that is why I promote hemp. It's not because hemp is a different plant or, or whatever. It's because it's it's where cannabis reform is happening. And so so what do I see going forward? I think you're right. 2024 is going to be a, a really big year in a lot of ways for, for cannabis. It may be the biggest year we've had in 100 years. I mean, truly, because all of these things are coming together. And the vision that I have is a vision where, where hemp um, really truly normalizes, where where the hemp operators are able to expand and grow, where marijuana operators are able to expand and to grow and to pivot into hemp and embrace that. And the regulators are not shoved aside. The regulators are brought into the whole fold. And we say, look, here's what we need. We need to, I guess I'll just jump into it. Sorry, with regulations, we need age gating. You know, I, I think everyone agrees to, with that. We need um, quality control. We, you know, when, when I go to the, to the grocery store or the, or, or the, pharmacy or whatever, and I want to buy a dietary supplement or a food or whatever, I, I want to know at a baseline that it's safe 
um, and it's not going to harm me. And we need those kind of controls and we need labeling controls. So that same deal, so that the consumer knows what he or she's getting. Um, and, and that those are, are, or, or things that everyone can agree to, you know, when we get into how much a tax should be and how the, you know, people can, can, can disagree about those types of things. But, but I think we need to scale back and step back and say, wait a second, you know, the super majority of, of Americans want um, cannabis reform and want to use these products. And a lot of people want to get involved from a business standpoint. Let's just make that happen. So, so anyway, that, that's, um, that's what I see happening. Unfortunately, if only it was that easy, you know, we're looking at litigation and lobbying efforts and, and disputes and some, and fracturing of the, of the industry. And I think that's unfortunate, but it just is where, where we are. Well, I, I think you said it a hundred percent correct. And I agree with you. I, I think some of the roles of advocates like you and I are to find the bridges uh, between mm-hmm. that single plant um, community and to bring everybody back around that, this 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 is a good thing for the whole industry when hemp succeeds. It's not a bad thing for regulated marijuana, and vice versa. It's not a bad thing for hemp when regulated marijuana uh, su- succeeds. Uh, sure. uh, broadly speaking, one of the things that 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 I'm out there talking about is the the ways in which you can create solidarity. My my uh, ideas are that the way that the hemp products fit most neatly is not by trying to compete head on um, uh, milligram for milligram with the regulated products, that it fits most neatly with the low dose complementary products there where there's a natural handoff between uh, consumers looking for very low dose products somewhere in the 1.5 to 7 milligram THC uh, concentration per, per package and regulated marijuana somewhere over 10 milligrams and all the way up to you name where where it could go. Um, and then advocating very vocally for a, uh, a rescheduling uh, to eliminate the 280E tax burden for the regulated cannabis side or a descheduling altogether to kind of level the playing field and just create a, a very basic single plant um, um, uh, products market. Are those things resonating with you or where do we potentially diverge? Sure. Um, I think you and I are on the same page in a lot of ways. I think we diverge there a little bit. I, I, I think this idea of a two path structure, the marijuana regulated structure and the, and the hemp structure, um, I, I think that they need to converge rather than continue to, to diverge. And I think that um, you know, separating them in terms of intoxication, potential milligrams, things like that. It's, it's all, it's all arbitrary. And, you know, I think adults who have access to the information they need with la- labels and, and access to products that we know are safe because they're regulated for safety and, and making sure that, that kids can't get access to them. I think once that's established and it, it's largely already there, but once that's really truly established at, 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 a, at a national level, I think that adults can make informed decisions about what they purchase. Oh, I want a low dose product. Here's the range of products in this store or e-commerce site that I want to get. And here's the high dose. You know, when I go into, um, you know, say a, a store that sells alcohol products, you know, I can buy a bottle of wine. Uh, I can buy a bottle of, of, of vodka or I can buy a bottle of Everclear. You know, no one's asking me about the milligram, whatever. I make my own informed decision. And I absolutely, as an aside, think that these references to alcohol are so, so lame, but, but it's kind of the best thing we got. I'm not comparing alcohol to marijuana and then, and cannabis and, okay, and all that. What you're saying you, you want a, a yeah. single shop where I could buy the full spectrum. If I want a low dose, it's there. If I want a high dose, it's there. Right. Let's not draw arbitrary distinctions. Right. And to get to the to federal rescheduling and descheduling, I mean, 100 percent that has to happen. And I don't know why the Biden administration has has failed to, to do this, um, but it has. And frankly, our Congress has failed us for years and years and years, even with basic measures. And so at this point, I think, you know, as as, as citizens of the United States, um, we have a different pathway. We don't have to sit around and, and wait for Congress to fix this. Congress, in its way, fixed this. It allowed a path and that path is hemp. And so what I see is as we embrace this more, all of the products, as you mentioned, that are available in regulated markets are available as hemp now. There's not like a, well, it's sort of like, or it's what, they're all available. And so I think that as everyone moves towards that, I think we essentially pull Congress with us. So at some point, whether it's a year from now, five years from now or whatever, the whole country has been operating with 
hemp, which is just to say cannabis, having the products that we need, having regulations that, that work, having businesses enter the space that because they can, because, you know, um, and, and then Congress will just eventually just deschedule will almost be a non-event. It'll be something that just sort of happens because, gosh, we should have done this years ago, but we've already got the market established and nothing really changes at that point. I think so. In other words, I see it as not like, well, let's continue to push Congress to do the thing that it's just failed us on doing and take the path that's already there, the market that's already there and just continue to push that out. Well, that's certainly going to require some uh, uh, advocacy uh, because (laughs) I think a lot of people are concerned that uh, the the way the farm bill opened up um, Pandora's box for for a hemp, mm-hmm. uh, you know they, they they did create an arbitrary formula for yeah. for for a legal definition, which as a lawyer, you know, who was thinking, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but the, the bottom line is there you know these these um, chemists and 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 science genius uh, that that were working with the plant were like, oh, we can isolate this, we can ratchet up that, we can do these things, so. It, it, it did create a plethora of uh, highly intoxicating uh, product lines that were, quote unquote, federally legal. Um, so, you know, I'm with you that, yeah, it could all be accomplished through the hemp side. But I'm also more of a pragmatist that says, but that's not where we are. And we do have regulated marijuana. We're not likely just mm-hmm. going to see like anytime soon, everything just be like, oh, no, it's hemp and, and all the undoing of those other things. So. I am more of a, well, what is it? What are some steps towards uh, um, working together and creating more of a harmonious uh, community around the plant concepts? That's why I, I, I'm more of an advocate on that low dose side, because I know uh, I know there's a handoff there where, especially in states that have regulated marijuana and are subject to that 280E, it, you know, it, it would undermine the, the entire program potentially if you had the same products next door at your CBD store and they weren't paying the taxes. And now you've got um, you know, the federal government coming out and saying, uh, well, if you're FDA approved doing hemp stuff, you can't do marijuana stuff. It's, you know, they're only making more, more confusion out there for, um, for the regular people and businesses that are operating in this space. Um, can you imagine that uh, you know, while, while we can both agree that you're right, that it is one plant and that we could do this through the hemp side that perhaps a more um, pragmatic approach might be to look where, where, where are the lanes right now where we could create a more harmonious marketplace? Yeah, I think, you know, I guess where I fall is that why do we, why do we continue to prop up a fail, a failing system? You know, it's not like, you know, I think a couple of things, it's one, it's one is not like a marijuana operator can't, participate in the hemp space. You know, I, I don't think it's a zero sum game here where either hemp has it or marijuana has it. But I think that, that continuing with this, this two lane path where we have the regulated market and all of the sort of high intoxication, high milligram, whatever goes to that and a low milligram goes to hemp, I think is playing a zero sum game that, that, that actually is, is fictional. It doesn't have to exist. Um, you know, regulated marijuana is going to have its place right now for sure. Sure. Um, but it can it can participate in hemp and and broaden. I mean, hemp is bigger than marijuana now. Continue to to broaden its scope um, there. And also, you know, we're we're assuming that people have have access, but but people by and large in a lot of states don't have access to regulated marijuana. And so, you know, maybe if regulated marijuana was there was a system in place in all 50 states and it really was kind of the same. Maybe, maybe we could consider it, but you know, you're taking away business opportunities for people that are, that are in business, federally legal businesses. You're, you're just, you're, you're taking away business from them. You're taking away cannabis um, products from, from people who currently have access to them by sticking to this, this bifurcated market. And so if, if something's broken, let's fix it. And I think the way to fix it is to, not just throw up our hands and abandon it, but but continue to expand with hemp and let let the regulations begin to evolve in a way that's so so that this regulated market will slowly sort of sort of die and be folded into the larger cannabis market, which we currently call hemp. And then um, anyway, I, and maybe it's idealistic, but I don't think so. I mean, it's here right now. I mean, in, yeah. in my hometown of Asheville, North Carolina, which is a prohibition state, um, and there's been no marijuana reform whatsoever. You can walk into a store and, you know, there's store, store, stores, plural, 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 and, and buy any cannabis product that you want 
um, and, and it's legal and it's, they're nice stores and nice products and everything else. Why take a, a, a you know? concept? Yeah. So, and the other thing, and, I, and one thing I, I think that, that's missing in this conversation that I want to kind of start to bring out is, you know, the world is starting to turn on to this. You know, we're, we're seeing the, the back and forth with German legalization. Um, South American countries are coming on board. There's other European countries. I just saw today a, a story about Japan. Well, our regulated uh, marijuana um, market cannot participate in that market at all because it's federally illegal. It can't even cross a state line, much less a, an international line. Hemp is exactly the opposite. And a lot of our hemp products, in fact, all of them on some level, um, satisfy the requirements for these countries' medical, and they don't call them recreational, but their cannabis programs. And so why not, again, you know, continue with this momentum and allow our cannabis industry to participate internationally and set us up for success as a country, as a cannabis, you know, uh, instead of failure, instead of kind of continuing to hem us in? Hey, amen to that. I, I'm... Uh... I think you're you're exactly correct. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the most exciting things that I'm I'm watching and participating in is the emergence of uh, a thriving hemp beverage industry, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm sure that you've had some some hands on with that. To me, that is the clear uh, front runner for normalcy uh, uh, coming through hemp. Uh, that mm-hmm. these beverages offer an appeal to a demographic that has largely not been marketed to by cannabis. Uh, it comes through the not the regulated stores, but more the your grocery stores, your Kroger's and things like that. Total Wine and more uh, those kinds of, of places. The 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 real competitor for those products are not cannabis businesses, but alcohol businesses. Now uh, we've seen Molson Coors come out and say that they're going to go heavy into non-alc. Well, what does that really mean? Are you going to create another Miller Zero or are you going to come up with a, an alternative product altogether, probably a hemp beverage that has some level of intoxicating uh, um, THC con- uh, con- uh, concentration in there? Um, what are your thoughts on, on that industry and do you think of it as one of those important vehicles for normalization? Absolutely. You and I are on the same page. Exactly, Eric. I think that the, the beverage side is, is, a, is a huge move towards normalization. And I can speak both as a lawyer and as a, as a consumer. Um, as a lawyer, that we're seeing a lot of that. I mean, that's really coming through our office a lot, and we're seeing it expand dramatically. I recently, um, where there was a Forbes article that was released about a week ago, um, the reporter called me and I spoke about it. I uh, referred him to several of my clients who then re- appeared in the article, and I think it really expanded both his understanding and I think the world at large of like this is what's happening in, 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 in a really big way. And it's happening at the level of very small producers all the way up to the multinational alcohol producers are seeing a decline in, in drinking um, alcohol, but they're seeing this this desire ramp up. And then from a personal level, I um, – I enjoy all sorts of alcohol products, but I have recently, I'm 51. I've recently decided that for, for, you know, for health reasons, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stop drinking. And so I've stopped drinking. Um, and, and I have um, been enjoying cannabis beverages myself. In fact, for Thanksgiving, I ordered a case of, of some, um, of some cannabis beverages to my mom's house and I shared them with family members. And we all, as, as we would normally be sitting, you know, sipping on a drink, yeah, you know, an alcohol drink. A lot of us were sipping on a, on a cannabis beverage drink and, and it was, it was same. great. Yeah, it was fantastic. And, and, the, and the way I've been talking about it to folks is that, you know, this product is for folks that have zero to little experience with cannabis. It's an introductory mm-hmm. product. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, yeah. it could be whatever. For me, it wasn't. But yeah, but a lot, for a lot of people, right. it, is, yeah. so it, it could be ratcheted up anything you want. But in, by in general, it's an opportunity to introduce cannabinoids uh, to a more passive consumer who's looking for, I can't keep drinking beer. I don't want wine. I, I'm done with liquor. I, I, I want something that's social. I want to be able to drink this at a family picnic or a church event or the Super Bowl. If there's a cooler with Budweiser, I want a cooler with hemp beverages right next to that. Um, and I think you're right. I, I think people are going to gravitate towards that who have never considered uh, marijuana at all as something for themselves, but the form makes it more appealing and then when you add in and it tastes good and, it, and, and, the, and the effects could be moderate for the people that are looking for uh, more of a mild uh, um, thing rather than something more ratcheted up, 
but then also for people that want their uh, 151, I'm sure you could find those products as well. <laughs> I think they exist too. Yeah, and I think it opens up the forums, for lack of a better word, for cannabis to be normalized and enjoyed. You know, for everyone from the from the neighborhood barbecue, I, I actually took a cannabis beverage to, to a neighborhood barbecue recently. And for the people that, that were inquisitive, I told them. But other, otherwise, it wasn't like I was over in the corner smoking a joint or, or popping a gummy beforehand. It was, I was just sipping on a drink. And so some people didn't even know the difference. Some people did, and they were curious, but then also from the, from the sort of neighborhood aspect to the, to the commercial, you know, you think about sports music, you know, venues like that and, and where you can go and, and you can order a, you know, a, a soda, you can order a beer or you can order your, your cannabis beverage and enjoy that. Uh, during the event. I think it's going to open things up considerably. I think you're totally right. I think we're going to start seeing uh, very reputable uh, um, celebrities and sports and entertainers endorsing various beverage brands. And, and uh, I think, you know, we've already seen an opening in sports. Wrigley Field has a CBD relationship and ha allows for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, them to advertise there. So I think we're going to see more opportunities in sports. The leagues themselves, these players associations are, are already – working on uh, marijuana consumption for their players, not to be an offense that gets them suspended or things like that, but is viewed as a more uh, a wellness uh, product for them where legal, uh, but we haven't quite seen it um, uh, venture over into the commercial aspects for the leagues. But of course, that's going to happen at some point. Uh, if we can yeah. have you know, the gambling stuff all over the sports stuff. <laughs> Who would have thought you could do that 15 years ago? You know? Right. That's exactly right. But, you know, and, and not to, to beat the, the proverbial dead horse, but this does circle back around our conversation about hemp. This this rapid expansion into multiple venues and areas of uh, um, with, with, with cannabis beverages is not really possible at least not on any kind of a uh, large scale with the regulated marijuana side of things, but, but it is with hemp. And again, the same beverage, you can have, you know, a five milligram seltzer of marijuana, um, or you can have five milligram seltzer of, of hemp. It's the exact same five milligrams of THC, you know? And so with hemp, this can happen where it can't happen with, with the regulated marijuana industry, again, at least at the same scale. And I think that this is an enormous opportunity that we can grasp and run with. But the, the types of onerous regulations and prohibitionist moves and I think, you know, self-defeating advocacy on, on parts of some in the, in the marijuana side, you know, kind of fail to see this. Like, hey, let's embrace this because this is really a, a way to, to push Absolutely. cannabis reform in, 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 a, in a big way. Absolutely. And, and if you are part of the, the, the one plant community, which I consider myself a part of, then mm -hmm. you look for the successes on both sides and you look for yeah. the bridge and you advocate for the single plant uh, and, and you get common sense regulations over time. We hope, we pray. We do, for sure. <laughs> Rod, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I'd like you now, just before we close, if you could uh, use one word to describe your present uh, experience, feeling, um, understanding, hopes, whatever, about uh, the cannabis hemp um, in the world, what would that word be? That's a really easy one. The word is excited. You're excited. Well, Rod, I'm excited with you. I'm looking forward to 2024. Uh, I'm looking forward to the good work that you're doing out there. And I appreciate everything you have done uh, on behalf of the plant and the community around it. Well, Eric, as, as they say in, in Mexico, where I live part-time at Gualamente, I appreciate all the good work you're doing. It's really nice to talk with you in this in this um, capacity. We talk on the phone sometimes, we email, but just to be able to chat it out like this is great. So thanks for having me on your on your show, and, um, and I really um, have enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. This is Above the Haze. I'm Eric Postow. With me today was Rod Kite of Kite Law. Great conversation.